Hold on, hold on. Mar- Should I put on his jersey for this? <laughs> you don't have to. It'll take two seconds. We are redrafting every single NBA draft from 96 on, starting today on this podcast. All right, so I'll take Kobe first because he's one of the 10 best players of all time. You know, I, I didn't even really full. There's no way he would have gone first. It would have been absurd, impossible, et cetera. But it is funny that Philly had the first pick in this draft. And and he was playing there and he was in their backyard. But, you know, uh, I that wonder. Was, it wasn't going to happen. There's no way. No, if they I know had taken it was Kobe Bryant, number one over Allen Iverson. Forget it. I even if they had taken him sixth, I think people would have been mad. But it's just kind of funny because once the high schoolers started to have success, there is a world where five years later, no somebody doubt. like Co- somebody like Kobe could yeah. have gone number one in a draft. It was not happening in 1996. So anyway, I, I have Agreed. Kobe Bryant as the first pick. Now you're on the clock at number two for uh, for the sake of the redraft. Toronto had this pick. Okay, this is... Uh, I'm not doing this to get attention. I'm not doing this for any other reason than there's no way I would take Iverson here. And I think 90% of the people listening are like, are you nuts? You have to take Iverson after Kobe. I don't think anybody would take Iverson over Kobe. I don't think it's that ridiculous. But Iverson, and I can go through all this Iverson stuff if you want to, or we can wait until we pick him, but I would take Nash. I think Nash... Plugging him in to any scenario, he makes everybody better. He should have shot more. Um, Honestly, I always thought if he was healthier later on, and this isn't me pretending he's all of a sudden healthy, but he would have been an awesome two guard at like 20 minutes a game just hitting threes. Uh, But he just, you know, the back couldn't stay healthy. But his impact on a team was far more positive than Iverson's. And I would take Nash on our redraft. So I have Nash ranked higher on my Hall of Fame pyramid, and I'm with you. I would take him higher as well. I loved Iverson. I'm actually in the super defensive about Iverson camp because I knew what's happened over the last 10 years. You could feel the seeds of it being planted last uh, in the 2000s, where as the future generations came and they had no idea what it was like to watch him play and see him all the stuff that he brought to the table, it was never going to translate to 50 years later. Oh, what is, what was this guy? What's going on here? This, the advanced metrics were never going to be his friend. With all that said, I just would rather have Nash. And, you know, I think his teams were consistently more successful. He made other guys better. He could play with just about anybody. And, you know, he, his peak basically goes from 98 through 2011. Iverson's peak he it really kicks in in 98 and he has you know he averages 29 a game from 1999 through 2008 10 straight years 29 a game it's weird he never had that second you know really qualified all-star other than Carmelo when he got to Denver on the other hand he played with a lot of good players who were kind of qualified to be second second guys on a really good team. Like when they got to Kembe, he was the defensive player of the year. He was still a top four center. He had Jerry Stackhouse who eventually became a 30 point scorer. You know, I, it's not like he never played with anybody. I don't think it's like a T-Max situation. Right. But the difference is, is like T-Max style didn't make the rest of the roster think like, what am I doing here? Iverson style. Like he, they didn't get rid of Stackhouse because they didn't like Stackhouse. It's like, let's try something different. And yes, they tried the Larry Hughes thing, which we went over in one of the other drafts. Uh, they had Andre Iguodala there. I even really liked that Theo Ratliff group, but then Larry Brown's like, look, I can bring in Dikembe, so I'm going to go ahead and do that kind of stuff. But Van, Horn, year, Van Horn was the other one they had. And Van Horn right. was the second pick in the draft. He brought in these guys. So that first year Iverson comes in, and this is the difference. And look, no one's trying to tell you that Iverson's LeBron, but I think that there's a lot of shortcomings here when you look at the overall career arc here and I'm not trying to do the analytics let's trash him you know the shooting efficiency and all that kind of stuff I mean the guy was that small playing like 41 42 minutes a game I think he played like 41 minutes a game for his career and he was still doing it at the very end um but when he go, it comes into the league, a bad team goes 22 and 60. Look, bad records those first two years. He gets to the second round of his third year, second round of his fourth year. Then they make the NBA finals. And that's pretty much it, man. From 2002, 2003 season, it's a six game loss in the second round of the Pistons. He never got to the second round again. He right. never got to the second round again. So I understand when you get Iverson, you get somebody that, you know, we applaud him for keeping it real. And, that's awesome. We applaud we we applaud him for kind of being anti-corporate, even though he was that. He did 
transcend. He was a smaller guy dunking on people. He was, you know, Newport News, the whole deal. Like, we get it. But if you really break down, and I'm not even trying to do the analytic things here, you just had to play a certain style that was only his style, and it was far less successful than I think people ever want to remember historically. So I would actually take Ray Allen ahead of him in my draft if you're not taking Iverson third. So it's funny. I had Allen ahead of uh, Iverson in the Hall of Fame pyramid. I mean, I'm sorry. I had uh, Iverson ahead of Ray Allen in the Hall of Fame pyramid. I th- I yeah. just think he had a more meaningful career. The two things, I, I agree with 90% of what you just said. Two things Iverson brought to the table that can't be Take it for granted. He, and I wrote about this in my book when my thing about him was about when you get season tickets in the mail and you're just looking at the schedule and you're like, who are, my, who are the eight guys I have to see this year? And it might be five guys. It might be seven. It might be nine. Like if, if you're doing it this year, you know, if we had the NBA right now, you'd be like, you'd, you'd take the Laker game. You'd put a check mark next to that. You'd, you'd do Giannis. You do the Celtics. But if you're just talking about individual players, there's not many. Like, I I really like seeing Dame Lillard in person. Like, you go on down the line, and there's maybe 8 to 12 guys. Iverson was always on that list for me, no matter how his team was doing. I thought he was an incredible guy to see in person because he was really, like, probably 5'9 and a half, 5'10". The, the way he carried himself, how much he played, he never came out. He carried himself like he was like a seven foot, 300 pound guy, and he wasn't. So I would say that for that. And then the other thing is the respect the other guys had for him, which I think matters. I think when you talk to some of these guys, which both of us have had the privilege of doing, and sometimes it's eye opening who they who they go out of their way to gush about. I think Kyrie was like that in in you know, the 2016, 17 range where the other players were almost like his biggest advocates. And I think with Iverson, the other players, regardless of whether the win totals and the other stuff backed it up, they really respected him. And even in the all-star game, like he was always in crunch time. He was always, you know, it always made sense that he had the ball at the end of the game, no matter how many good players were on the floor. So it's a really weird career that I almost can't compare to. Nobody like him now you could even say it would be like if Damian Lillard was the toughest guy in the league and, but his team wasn't even as successful as it is now, but it felt like they were more successful. That was Iverson. I have no counter to that. I think the best thing you could do would be Jordan without rings. (laughs) Like if Jordan just, you know, if Jordan couldn't get past the Pacers in the second round for whatever reason, uh, but that it's just impossible. It's, It's impossible to even try to do that. Like, Hey, imagine a, a 20 year arc of Jordan without success. I mean, as I say it out loud, it's just, it's impossible to ever vision, envision that. But I think all the pro Iverson arguments become about a lot of the stuff that doesn't equate to winning, but I have no counter. Like I made sure I got a chance to go see him because I wanted to see him. That Iverson remember- Ray Allen showdown is one of my favorite basket. It's probably one of my favorite sporting events ever. Just being in the moment with my buddies in college and watching those two go at it in the biggest tournament. I absolutely love it. So this is not an anti-Iverson thing. This is strictly a, he did not care about winning. He did not approach the game in a winning way for me to pass on somebody like Steve Nash. And I think Nash was definitely the right pick. I cannot figure out what the ceiling was on an Iverson team. We saw it in 2001. They made the, the finals. wasn't that good. I East wasn't that good. That and I got to be honest, I don't think the right team made the final that year for the East. I thought the Bucs were better. Milwaukee, I did too. Yeah, and you watch those games, and it's kind of hard to believe the Bucs didn't beat them. The Bucs just seem like more of a finals team. Um, I, Iverson had a better career. He was a more memorable player. If I'm drafting this, if I'm a GM, and I have time machine access in 1996, I would take Ray Allen with the third pick because I'm getting, I'm getting him for 18 years. I'm getting this guy who at his peak, which he had a couple really nice ones on Milwaukee, um, you know, was the alpha dog on a Bucks team that almost made the finals, but just in general was one of the most efficient guys we've had in the last 25 years. I can put him with anybody. He goes and has a second life with the Celtics. And then this third life with Miami. 
And I was just watching uh, Game 6 2013. I just think he's a safer bet if I'm trying to win a title than Allen Iverson was. Now, I didn't realize that at any point during Iverson's career. But now if I'm looking back, if my goal is to win the title, Ray Allen is a better pick. He just is. So I would take Ray Allen third. Ray's interesting in that you said it. He'd had like these two versions. I, I think it's three versions because no, there I'm, is three. The Milwaukee oh, you, version. Maybe it's four. Maybe it's yeah. four though because I mean, what he started doing, you know, in Milwaukee, he's he's twenty a game. The three point numbers are just crazy. Uh, I remember when I was doing that Celtics TV stuff for years, and you know, he first got there in 07, 08, and I was working with Donnie Marshall, who knew. Ray from the Yukon years and and Donnie was a little bit older than him and Donnie was was just a great guy to talk hoops with and he comes back he goes man he goes Ray like changed his shot I'm like Ray Allen changed his jump shot I'm like why would like why would anyone do that that's like DiCaprio deciding you know I want to I want to do spoken word and you're like what right so Ray did this little thing with like his hands at the end of it and and Ray was right like Ray made this tweak to what already looked like the wettest jumper going and he had this awesome Seattle stretch where he put up huge. He's 25, 26 a game. So when he came to Boston 07, 08, and that was kind of the first piece when it looked like they were going to trade Paul, but Ainge was always great and not trading Pierce just because he felt like, oh, the rest of the team isn't good. But Ainge was brilliant with that. And I know it sounds stupid to say brilliant, but so many other people wouldn't do it. Be like, hey, we're not any good. All right, well, this guy that isn't 30, that's really good. Let's get rid of him. <laughs> you know, like other teams did that. And they add Ray to that for Jeff Green, which seems criminal. Yeah. Because Ray still at that point, you know, he'd had the ankles things. He comes in 32, but that led to KG and all that stuff. Ray sacrificed more more with his approach to the game than the other two guys did. Now, I still think KG and Paul were better than Ray, and Ray then becomes this guy who's trying to figure out around him because he was a better shooter with the ball and then found a way. I, I really think it took him a while to kind of get comfortable in that you're just not going to have the ball in his hands that much, and he found that with Miami because it was weird, too. Do you remember in Boston when he started to kind of lose his handle? Because he, yeah. he wasn't dribbling as much in Boston's offense, and then he just kind of lost his handle a little bit there. So I... Uh, I, man, I wonder how bad people are going to get about this. So you passed on Iverson for Ray, but the analytics will tell you that Ray's behind only Kobe in like two or three of the categories. Well, so I'm looking at this like not who is going to, who's going to sell more jerseys and who's going to be more fun to have on my team. If I'm just trying to win a title, Ray Allen has to be the pick. You look at his numbers from 2000 to 2007. He is the most ahead of his time guy we've had in the last 30 years. He's averaging 23, 5, and 4. His 45, 40, 89 percentages. He's shooting 40, 40 from three, but he's taking seven threes. And this is at a time nobody was taking, you know, if he took four threes a game, that was a lot. I think if you put him in the era that we're in now, he's one of the 10 best guys in the league every year. That version of Ray Allen year after year is somebody you could build a franchise around. And I don't know. I, the longevity, I think, pushes it over the top to me. This guy was good in 1997. In 1994, in 2014, he's still in the finals playing crunch time for that Miami team. We're talking, you know, uh, 18 years. Iverson just flamed out a little too fast for me. Iverson's career was basically over by 2009. Yeah, he hasn't played in a decade. Yeah. You know, he had so, that weird Memphis thing and then he had closed it out in Philly just as kind of like a novelty deal. And remember, he still wanted to play. But at that point too, like if you really want to dig into all this stuff, and I don't know how far, we, I don't really want to get sidetracked in here, but Iverson, if he played today with the off the court stuff, he'd be getting suspended from the league. So his career is effectively his last good year as a legitimately effective player is 2009. And I remember and I have this, it's in my archives. You can look it up. Um, not you, but uh, anybody out there when Denver trades, uh, Iverson to Detroit for Billups and people are on TV going great trade for the Pistons. You know, you get Allen Iverson and I'm like, you, I, I'm sorry, but I'm going to basketball games and watching league pass. Like Iverson shot as a, as a perennial all-star franchise guy. It's just gone. He doesn't have it anymore. So I think the fact that his kind of stretch was just shorter than, uh, than Ray's, I think that has to matter. And the other thing I would ask, 
So if Iverson, if Milwaukee beats them that 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 round, which is really conceivable, and I think they should have. I really think the wrong team won, and I think that was one of the most poorly officiated series ever. How do we remember Iverson? If we don't even know, like no finals trips, I think he's thought about completely differently. We're, you know, you're almost thinking, I'm trying to think who the football quarterback is that we would compare him to. Uh, Flacco? No, <laughs> Flacco. <laughs> no, that was nice. Uh, I, I really think that 2001, like I used to always think LeBron deserves like a half a ring for that 2007 NBA finals appearance because of yeah. what they did to Detroit. Like he'd only been in the league, you know, not even five years. Detroit still, you know, they look at themselves as the bully Rashid's guaranteeing wins after every single playoff loss. They kept losing. And LeBron takes him out with that epic game in 2007 where it was like kind of the first like, whoa, what is this guy? And then they get smoked by the Spurs. Not a big deal. Same thing as kind of like a, a Shaq Penny deal with Orlando going up against Akeem. But that 2001 finals, they get the first game against LA and they get mopped. He's gotten a lot of run at it. Like, I feel like, I'm not saying people like, look, the Lakers are supposed to beat them. We've just gone through how bad we didn't think the East was that year. But it's it's salvaged Iverson in a way where, you know, I, I got to read about Chris Paul sucking all the time because he can't get out of the second round. But Iverson, as the lead guy, the undisputed lead guy for every team he was on until, you know, look, the Denver thing was kind of heeing back and forth. And you're right. By the time he got to Detroit, it was over. Uh, he gets Did you. I'm not saying like I, you know, I don't want to turn this in. I'm, I'm sounding very anti Iverson, but I'm I'm just saying like no, we're, 2000 we're both pro Iverson. 2001 is so positive for him, and I think that's the love that people have for him. You know, like it's never ever held against him that that's kind of the only real playoff run that you had, like the only one. Right. Well, the other thing, and again, I I didn't want to rely on the stats too much because I really think it's important to mention how how larger than life he was at the time and what it was like to watch him in person. I just loved Iverson, but you know, his stats, part of the reason his stats were so impressive was he just played an incredible amount of minutes. If you go to his per 36 numbers, his per 36 scoring average is 23.3. His per, his actual scoring average in real life is 26.7. He played, so he, he was, as you said earlier, he's playing for his career. He played 41.1 <laughs> minutes a game. It's, uh, it's, like, I'm, it's like he's Will Chamberlain. And, and it I wasn't think, like he was getting any sleep. You know? I do, right. It's true. He's up 24 hours a day. So I, if you look at his per 36, <laughs> he's, he's 23, 5, and 3. He's 42.5% uh, from the field and 31% from three. And his stats really aren't different than all of Ray Allen's prime because Ray Allen's playing 35, 36 minutes a game, not 40. It's honestly not crazy to think Ray Allen is a better pick than Allen Iverson because if you're trying to win a title, he's just a safer bet. You can put Iverson, you have to move your whole team around what he does. With Ray Allen, you didn't have to do that. So I'm taking Ray Allen third. Uh, I, you know, you mentioned Ray Allen being ahead of the time. Uh, I was looking up. I looked at one of the years where he had like 7.78 attempts there a game from three, which is just, it can't express how monumental that is in like 0102. Eight players took 400 or more threes. Of course, like number one and number three were, were Twan and Pierce, which right. didn't even count because the beginning of, of the Patino, Twan, Pierce thing was just gross with the amount of threes. So this guys took, like, you think guys take bad shots now? You think D'Angelo Russell or Zach Levine get a little aggressive every now with a three-point attempt? You got you got nothing on early Twan. Um, yeah. So eight players, 400 or more attempts. The past full season, 18-19, 43 players took 400 or more threes. No one more than James Harden, who took 1,028 threes. And also 858 free throws. So Harden took almost 1,900 threes and free throws for a full season. Enjoy that. That's pretty gross, but nothing was grosser than watching a Kyle Lowry offensive file, uh, offensive foul mixtape that came out from so far this season. I think he has 47 charges taken. I counted 46 flops. I would rather watch a Joe Exotic sex tape than Kyle Lowry <laughs> taking charges. You know, I saw that tape floating around and I was like, I hope Priscilla doesn't Which, see that. Which, the Joe He's Exotic gonna, one? No, either. 
<laughs> yeah, the Lowry one, I didn't even make it through it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch this, and then I'm going to count how many flops there are, and then I'm going to tweet something really shitty. And I, I, had a, I actually closed out of the video. I couldn't, couldn't Smart. do it anymore. So you, you have Iverson fourth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's he not can't drop the list here. Yeah. So Vancouver with Ray Allen and then Iverson with uh, going to Milwaukee at four. And, I, you know, I know people are going to get pissed about the Iverson thing. I remember, um, remember TNT did that redraft of the all-timers and Barkley took Allen Iverson first and it almost cost like a riot. It almost caused a riot on the internet. People are like, what are you doing? How? You, remember they were all drafted in their all-time teams and it was a snake draft. And Barkley had like the third pick. He took Iverson. And people were like, you've just ruined this whole exercise. And he's like, I don't care. Alan Iverson was great. And every television producer everywhere was like, how do we find the next Barkley? So with the fifth pick, which in the, uh, in the actual draft was Minnesota, there's two, well, there's three guys on the board. Just so for the people listening at home, we got Jermaine O'Neal, Ben Ben Wallace, Pe- Peja Stakovic, Marcus Camby, Stefan Marbury, even Antoine Walker. All those guys are on the board. I am taking, because this will be a recurring theme with these redrafts that we do. I watched Jermaine O'Neal be the best guy on teams that could have won the title. And that matters to me more than anybody else on that list. I thought long and hard about Ben Wallace, but his prime just wasn't good enough. The Jermaine O'Neal thing, really in the running for strangest uh, basketball reference page, he's on Portland for four years, not playing. Yeah, not playing, right? Remember, Patino was always trying to trade for him. Yeah, oh, every year. And he's just buried on these Portland teams behind Rasheed Wallace, Sabonis, Dale Davis is on there and they're not giving him any run. And people like us are like, he's being thrown. He was kind of like a Roddy Bubois type situation where the trade asset of him was so much more valuable than if you actually watched <laughs> him in a game, you're like, uh, but then he, then Indiana trades for him. Oh, I guess they traded Dale Davis for him or as, as part of it. But then, then he became a really, really, really good player in Indiana there for a couple of years. And that 04 series against Detroit, He's great. I thought the 05 year, the melee, he misses half the season. He's really good that year. He averaged 24 a game that year. I thought he was awesome in the uh, Celtics playoff series that year. And I really liked that post melee Pacers team just in general. Um, but I, for the amount of years he played and all that, I think he's the pick. So I'm taking him fifth. What do you think of that? I love it because I had him, I think, higher than, than I thought I would when I went into it. But I'm with you. If you go peak Jermaine O'Neal, he's a really good player. I mean, he put up some massive numbers there with the Pacers. But you're right. Like, he started he started 18 games those first four years. He played 10 minutes a game, 13 minutes a game, 9 minutes a game, 12 minutes a game when he was in Portland. And that was, you know, he was still kind of part of this fallout of the high school thing. And you'd just be like, oh, you know, look at this guy. And honestly, too, even though he was kind of this weird hybrid center power forward, that's what was so appealing about him, too, is that he could face up a little bit, but he could still do some of that traditional stuff. And he would have been in his prime younger, a really nice player today because he was a really, I thought, a pretty good athlete. And then he slowed down a little bit. But after that Pacers thing, I mean, it was over. Like his career was kind of like over by the time he was 29. And he still played a, another six or so years. So I, I don't mean to be harsh about it. Like he had a good year in 9-10 in Miami at, at 31, but he's playing 28 minutes. He's scoring 13 and 7 and he's he's just kind of a rotation guy at that point, even though he was somebody I still really like. I I liked it. I didn't I didn't have him that high, but I'm I'm not anti Jermaine O'Neal at all. Uh, so, so one I, one I, thing with him that I didn't realize, he made third team All NBA in 02 and 03, and then he made second team All NBA in 04. So for three straight years, he was a top fifteen guy and a top ten guy in 04. And I think he would have been a top ten guy in 05 too if the melee hadn't happened. I also think this point can't be hit strongly enough. I really do think the 05 Pacers were the best NBA team that year. And now you could say, well, the reason they didn't win is because Ron Artest was a lunatic and got into a huge melee and and the seeds of it were planted during that fight that that precipitated the melee and that team was going to blow up anyway. That team was, there was just too much craziness on that team. It never, they never could have made it eight months. You can make that case. 
But that 05 finals was one of the more unsatisfying finals. It never felt like those were the two best teams. The series itself wasn't that good. That Spurs team that won Duncan, it just was not like a peak Duncan performance. I think he was pretty banged up. I really think Indiana was the best team that year, and he was the best guy on that team. So that's got to matter, too. You're now on the clock at number six, which would have been the Celtics pick. I'm going to just tell Camby to take the Mass Pike in and be a Celtic. Uh, Camby played 17 years. Yes, I thought he was going to be better. His lead, you know who the most points per game he ever scored was his rookie year with Toronto? 15 a game. That's the most he ever scored for a season. And he was double figures, 12, 10, 12, 11. And he was basically wasn't again until he got to Denver a little bit. He's defensive player of the year. I just felt like he did more at UMass offensively and that when he got to the NBA, I don't know if it's because he was skinny. I don't know if it was strictly because of the roster development. And the NBA has a way of kind of eating itself in that, oh yeah, right? Like as good as you were in college, like you have to adjust to us. I didn't think Camby was going to have to make that adjustment that he was going to be a good player, a role player. So I guess I ended up being wrong, but I was watching him. He had 32 in that first game against Kentucky when Kentucky was number one. It was at the the Palace at Auburn Hills. UMass was fifth. That UMass thing was weird for all of us that were from Eastern Mass because we're like, are we really rooting for Western Mass? But it was so much fun with Cal, Lou Rowe the year before. And all those UMass guys. So I, I really thought that Camby was going to be able to do a little bit more offensively. And because he showed it at UMass, and then he just kind of became a very specific, uh, not a role player. That's that's not saying enough about him. He's a starter, he played for a long time, but I still thought there was a version of him that had a higher ceiling. I have a great Marcus Camby fact for you. He makes he has the iconic lockout 99 playoffs run where Ewing gets hurt and they're actually better off with Camby. They come back the next year. They almost make the finals again in 2000. Indiana beats them. He then makes the playoffs. One, two, three, four, ten more times. First round and out every time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but the difference is between, like, I hold the playoff stuff against you unless I really like you, then I'll find a way to spin it in my favor. But if you're the lead guy, it's kind of on you. Where it can be. I don't blame him for yeah. that. I'm just yeah. 10 straight first round That's exits. That's really, really, that might have to be near a record, right? 10 straight. If people say shit to Mello, Mello be like, hey, you ever heard of Marcus Camby? Like, get off of my back. Because I always felt like I, the Mello knocks were like Mello. Every time you look at Mello's playoff losses when they're all the first round exits, they almost always lost the team that was better than them anyway. Um, true. So that's that's kind of a pro Mello thing, but it's it just sounds better to be like, oh, he sucks in the playoffs. So do I you have, have any problem with the Camby? Do, do you? Dude, I make a mistake. How do you look at the board right now? I uh, I have a Marcus Camby point that's just for you. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna lightly fry it in some sesame oil and give you some dipping sauce with it, and you can just eat it because you're gonna enjoy it so much. Hold on, hold on. Mar- Should I put on his jersey for this? <laughs> you don't have to. It'll take two seconds. Marcus Camby ahead of his time. If if you take 1999 Marcus Camby and you move him forward 20 years, he's like the perfect five. Yeah, right? I mean, Tyson Chandler's still making money. I think Marcus Camby would have been like potentially like really in demand. Like if, if Capella ends up getting 14 million a year in a first round pick, I feel like Camby was better than Clint Capella, right? I don't know. I think Capella was a product of uh, Capella ended up being better than I thought he would be, but Capella also was a massive beneficiary of Harden, you know, because everybody's freaked out the whole time. Seventh pick. Um, this is tough. I had these guys. I had I had Canby, Wallace, and Stoyakovic all all huddled together. I guess I'm taking Ben Wallace at seven, undrafted. Which remains incredible. Um, yeah, because he was like 6'6", school Virginia. A way shorter kind of prime than I would have wanted. Detroit gives him that. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chicago signs him away from Detroit. It's a big deal. And within a year, he's kind of like, it's kind of like semi-luggage. They wouldn't let him wear a headband, remember? 
It's weird. But um, they, you could argue he was the best player in the 2004 Pistons in that playoff run. He, was, he might have been the most valuable. I know Chauncey won the uh, finals MVP. Uh, and I, I think it's hard to say who was the most important player on that Pistons team because one of the things that made them special was those five guys together and the way they complemented each other and how good defensively they were. But Ben Wallace was an absolutely destructive uh, player there for, you look at four straight, uh, five straight years, Jesus. Um, dating back to Orlando, just completely blowing it and getting rid of him. In the uh, in the Grand Hill trade, just having no idea what they have or, or what they had, you go after that. He shows up in Detroit in two thousand one, and from two thousand one to two thousand five, he's thirteen rebounds a game, three blocks a game, and one and a half steals a game. Like he he's his block steals there for half a decade are Hakeem David Robinsony, you know. And in, in person, it was the same thing. Like it really did feel like he was the best defensive player in the league. Uh, the biggest defensive asset anybody had there for a while. He he held his own against Shaq in, in 04 when Shaq was really trying to go back into the wayback machine and really only had one great ga game against him. And uh, I don't know. I mean, he brought so many bad things to the table. The free throw shooting was abominable. He was an offensive liability, but just figured out how to do so many different things. I would just rather have him than anybody else on this list. So there you go. I loved him. Uh, yeah, the best version of him was unbelievable. The way he could switch. He's listed at 6'9". I don't know. I don't even know. But it didn't matter. It was unbelievable watching what he could do as a defensive player. And that's what I really loved about that Pistons team is that you had Wallace who could switch out to anyone on the perimeter. Like he just could. But then you had Chauncey who could switch and defend some power forward in the post that he wasn't going to give up because Chauncey was so damn strong and smart. And Tayshawn had length to at least challenge a little bit. And then Rashid's there who could kind of be all over the place. I mean, it was really an incredible roster one through five of guys that you know just found a way to complement each other. I remember, look, I, I thought when we were making fun of the idea that, you know, we liked um, I, some of my misses, Marcus Pfizer being one of them. When I watched <laughs> Wallace in his fourth year at Orlando, yeah. I liked I liked him. I mean, he played 81 games that year. And I go, you know who I always kind of like a little bit? But you're right. I mean, he never cracked double figures. He ended up in the 30% in the free throw line. It was getting awful. I mean, it was like he was flirting with 50, and then it got worse. And I remember Larry Brown. There's always a very good lesson, too, for younger hoop people down there. Like, they were giving Ben Wallace some touches. Remember how weird that was when they Oklahoma City would let Perk get the first offensive touch of every game, and he would, like, get a play in the post, and you just be like, right. Why, what are you doing? Right. Um, I that was sort of just this thing that the Thunder always seemed to want to do. Probably Westbrook wanted to do it, and everybody just else had to listen. Uh, but Larry Brown, I'm serious. Larry Brown would talk about wanting Ben Wallace to get more touches, and I'd go, "Why would you ever do that with this guy? He's a zero on offense." But it was a really good point: is that it sucks to just rebound and defend the all game. So the more we can get him a touch every now and then, the more engaged he's going to be. So when there are plays that run that aren't the best offensive option, understand that there's there's a payoff to it if you have the right guy. And Wallace was that guy. So I peak Wallace, I I just loved his first seventy five playoff games for the Pistons from 02 to 05. He's fourteen rebounds a game, two point six blocks, two point oh steals. And he's just a menace, and he he barely he didn't even crack ten points a game during that stretch, but. I, he never I just, did. He's one of those guys that if you bet against them, you know, if you're actually like literally gambled against the Pistons in a playoff game, I it, I just hated going against him. I always felt like he was going to do the right thing at the right time. And you got I got to say the 05 finals, him and Rashid together, the job they did on Duncan. Duncan's never been treated like that defensively over the course of two weeks in his peak like he was in that. Like they really... They really throttled him. So I'm going seven. He goes to the Clippers. The number eight pick, this would have been the Nets. Who do you have? Peja. Yep. You know, yeah. There's an argument for Peja ahead of Camby, ahead of Wallace. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Peja flirting. You would know this probably better off the top of your head. But what did he come in second in the MVP one year? Was it third? No, but but he was. Or was he just no. in the conversation and I'm I'm not remembering the voting? 
No, he had a he had a year. Was he first team All NBA? He only made three All Star teams. Oh yeah, oh four. He was second team All NBA. And yeah, he was he fourth in the two thousand four MVP. Is that possible? I thought there was yeah. a year he was way he was, up there. Yeah. Our 2004 MVP ballot, Kevin Garnett first, Duncan second, Jermaine O'Neal third, Peja four, Kobe Bryant five, Shaq six, Ben Wallace seven. Saying Shaq out loud sixth just sounds fucking stupid. Well, that was the year when he... I know, but it was that was right. It was after everything had kind of calmed down, but I don't know. Just It's one of those Shaq MVP things. So it's funny. Peja was another little ahead of his time guy. Never took... Never took seven threes in a season. Year after year, starting in 01, he's shooting 40% from three. He has basically an entire decade until 2009 of shooting 40% from three. From 01 to 08, 41% from three, taking almost six a game, 20 a game. A guy who I think if he's playing now would have been so much more dangerous and so much more fun to watch. It's hard to think of him without thinking of him bricking that shot against in game seven against the Lakers when he just had both hands around his neck. But he rebounded at least a little bit from it. Yeah, big time numbers. And he was huge. Like this guy was a guy that could handle. I mean, he's listed at 6'10. I, you know, I don't know. I'm mean, shaving an inch here, but he never felt like the one. You, know, you never felt like, okay, they're, that's who their best player is. And, you know, we go back to the beginning of the Weber stuff and how good that Sacramento team was from a talent standpoint. But he put up some massive numbers, man. What like for, t- for, for somebody we never think of as, like, the key franchise guy, just, you're right. Like, those those middle years there, there's just, this is unbelievable. This is the eighth pick of this draft, and this is a guy that's still available. I'm going to lightly fry another great point and give you a little more dipping sauce with this one. Is he Clay with no PR? <laughs> Whoa. I don't think I responded well enough to your fried appetizer thing on the Camby thing. I just was sort of blown away by the whole deal. And I was kind of maybe just saying I want to change into that jersey because I was debating a tank top for the Zoom anyway. But yeah, what's he probably handled that ball a hell of a lot more than Clay did. That has to be because Clay, that's the beauty of Clay, he doesn't dribble. He was just as good of a three-point shooter as Clay was. He was actually, you could run entire offenses around him. I don't, I actually think if Clay was on a bad team, you could have run offenses around him, but they were weirdly similar, like what their skill sets were. And Clay, I think, um, you know, hits the lottery and ends up with Steph. I think if Peja had been on a team like that, we would have had one conversation about him over the last 10 years. When was the last Peja Stojakovic conversation anyone's had? It's never happened. Yeah, right. Like, I forgot he was in New Orleans for four years. He also had a very, very sneaky, nobody remembers this, 2011 Mavs. (laughs) Big big brother to Dirk kind of thing. Did he play in the playoffs for them? I'm going to look. Oh, yeah. Look at that. He's playing seven, he's playing 18 minutes a game for the 11 Mavs in the playoffs. Oh, wait, that's right. No, no, no. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody remembers that though. He's never mentioned as like, oh, remember when Peja got his ring? No, because the whole collection of those guys was that whole 11 Mavs team is just so weird because of, you're like, wait a minute, who was, because it was, you probably argue the least talented team. I don't know. At least, yeah, of the last 20 years, least talented team to win a title. It was certainly the uh, the only team that only had one great guy to win a title. Yeah, I mean, it's kid. But it, Jason Terry. Terry. Marion. Chan- Chandler and Marion. Chandler, but they, great role JJ, player. So. Yeah, Peja. Yeah. How about that? And Roddy Boubois, the untouchable Roddy Boubois. The asset. All right, ninth pick. This normally, we're, we're only going to 14. Ninth pick was Dallas. Uh, Marbury has officially fallen far enough. That guy was a huge asset. He, <laughs> I, I remember when he ended up on Phoenix finally after the kid trade, really, really enjoying him and Amari together. That one playoff series against the Suns. I, you know, he put up a, huge numbers. Like every he, night you'd be like 30 and 10 again from this guy. And he's somebody that if you put him now and you spread the floor for him, 
he was one of those guys that like Kevin Johnson's like this, uh, from, from way back. There's guys now like this, like Westbrook's definitely like this spread the floor. He's going by people and getting the rim. Marbury could get by whoever he wanted. If he is, wanted is Marbury Lillard with a worst attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've done like four Lillard comps on this pod already. I don't know. He, uh, you know, it's a classic. What if he KG gets this giant contract? Yeah. Then the rules change. And Marbury is just bummed out. He knows he's never going to make nearly as much as KG and he'll never be the number one guy on the team and pushes for a trade to the Nets. And he should have just stayed with stuff. It was one of those. Everyone was worse off by the trades. But, you know, I think we remember... He gets su- he goes to the Knicks. Things get super weird in a bunch of different ways. Finally, ends up on that weird 09 Celtics team, the where KG wasn't playing, and they, he was supposed to be the missing piece, scoring yeah, off the bench. People were really excited about that. I was not. I was not excited. You weren't excited about that. Was everybody gets way too excited about buyouts? I just feel like uh, point guards, especially, they hit a point and there's no coming back where it's almost like running backs with Frank Gore accepted where when they go from level one to level two or level three, wherever they're just, there's no rallying back. All right. You're up 10 Indiana, dude, an hour and a half in. I know we're going to zoom through this. (laughs) This is, uh, I could do a lot of different things here. There's one name out there that was productive. Just do it. The, it's the right pick. I, yeah, I, I still. It's the right pick. Second best player in a team that almost made the finals. I got to take Tuan over Sharif Abdul Rahim. You have to. It's the right pick. Now, Tuan, Tuan, Tuan is the best example. Go ahead. You, why don't you take the floor here for a little bit and I'll plug in in any holes. No, we, we don't need to do, we don't need to do 10 minutes on Ant Walker, but he made multiple all-star teams. It was second best guy on a team that almost made the finals. Like he, right. Sharif, Sharif never had one memorable basketball moment. Tuan yeah. is the second best player on a team that made the Eastern Conference finals. Oh, one. Right. No, no, I understand. But, um, I really feel like if we're going to knock, I mean, God, think how bad the East really was for, for that stuff to happen for them. Because they it's were terrible. up. Were they, we at one point were thinking they're going to play in the NBA Finals. Like, we're like, they're going to beat the Nets. Um, they took a 2-1 lead in that series. They took a 2-1 lead. That's right. They yeah. blow game four. They lose game five. And then Nets come in and finish them off in game six. But the blowing game four was, you know, I think they could have won if they didn't blow that game. There's a version of Tuan, and I have to draft the version that we saw over 12 years but there's a version of Tuan that that could have been his skill set was so high but Patino immediately hated him but then Patino was kind of like play defense and you guys can take all the bad threes you want his shot consciousness uh, consciousness was one of the worst of any player I've ever seen in my entire life except for his size he could handle he could pass he could do all these things but it just it was like it was just a little off. It was off just a little for it to actually be kind of tough to watch for really long stretches, and it wasn't a shock. You know, here's Ainge before he's the GM of the Celtics trashing his game on TNT broadcast, and the first thing he does when he gets the gig is gets Twan out of there. But I have a little bit of a soft spot, uh, soft spot in my heart for Twan, but too. I'm also fully willing to admit that it was really gross for long stretches. I, I likened it to... A little kid, like the youngest brother in a big family who just nobody's paying attention to. Like the bonus Jonas? Yeah, like the, the fifth kid in the Sullivans in Melrose <laughs> and the youngest kid and the other kids and one's in jail and one's the football quarterback. And then there's that fifth kid. Nobody knows where he ever is. And he just develops a bunch of bad habits. Tuan was just unchecked for the first five years of his NBA career, basically, and was in bad situations and developed some bad habits. But the thing that killed him was he lost his confidence with free throw shooting in 02 and 03. And once that happened, he stopped going to the line, he stopped driving to the basket, and he just became this jump shooter. And he was never like really a good shooter. What he was really good at was around the rims, 
rim stuff and his passing and he had all these different tools, but once he lost his free throw shooting confidence, it, it was a little like what happened to Rondo. When Rondo just didn't want to get fouled anymore, it completely changed how he played. It's and, really weird when you notice it, too. Yeah. And you usually only notice it if it's like your team and you're watching them all the time. Like, I remember Pierce had this really weird stretch where he wasn't making free throws in like close late situations to the point where I went through and tracked them all and then put it together was like, he's 80%. And he's like 63% in these spots. And I remember I asked one of our guys with the Celtics, I go, Hey, have you noticed this thing with Pierce? He goes, Oh my God. And then Pierce sort of figured it out and corrected it. And he was fine again. But Tuan, Tuan would also put together these moves for his size that most guys couldn't even dream of doing. And then he just back rim it. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen a guy break people down, get open these spin moves, back you down hooks, both hands. He had all of this stuff. And it was like, it was like a math equation where it looked at you did it and you were like, oh, look how good this is. And you're like, yeah, okay, but that's outside the parentheses. So none of this works. He was a really tough, confident guy who knew where to go and what to do in a basketball court. And he goes to Miami in 06 and plays big minutes for them and kind of knows where to go and what to do. Wasn't afraid to take big shots. He was afraid to get fouled, obviously. He that was, was not afraid to take big shots. There's not. nothing more Tuan than like up to... 50 seconds to go. He brings it into the front court. He jacks it because he wants to have the dagger shot. And he yeah. missed he missed him all the time. Yeah. He really wanted to. He, he Hero ball was something that meant a lot to him. <laughs> uh, all right. Four more picks left. Number 11th pick. Who has this pick in, in the actual draft? It was Golden State. Well, we'll do better than they did with that pick. <laughs> I, uh... I'm going Ogoskis here. You know, he hung around a lot longer than he should have. It seemed like when he hurt, when his feet started to go out on him, it just seemed like his career was going to be over in four or five years. It ended up playing for a pretty long time. Where was he in this? He was 20th in the actual draft. But, um, you know, he he hung around and he was for his career was 13 and seven. He, and you thought he was toast his third year in. He didn't play yeah. foot injury. So he missed basically his second and third season in the league comes back at 25 and you're like, well, this guy's shot. And he had a nice run. Beloved teammate. So I, I think that's the right pick. Who do you have for number 12? All right. Still a lot of value out there. I know I could do roll guy here, which is a reach. There's one, go in the first round. There's one famous roll guy left. Yeah. Although JYD, Junkyard Dogs, Jerome Williams out of Georgetown. Nice little run. But uh, he's still too talented. I used to argue for Sharif Abdul Rahim because he was he was the poster boy for his era of big numbers, empty. He sucks. His teams weren't very good. He was part of the Gasol thing that happened on trade night where Sharif went to Atlanta and then they stunk too. Do you know off the top of your head? How many playoff games Sharif Abdul Rahim played in his entire career? I do. It was one one playoff series, six total. I used to six make, games. I used to call it the Sharif Abdul Rahim All Stars for guys who just put up empty calorie stats. Like Zach Levine would be the Sharif MVP this year, right? But don't I still have to take him twelfth? Yeah, yeah. He's put up so, stats. So, and he was good. He actually was good. And maybe it's grosser now when a guard puts up empty stats than a big. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's kind of the cool inversion of of NBA eras here is that you had the empty calorie guys that were bigger and now the empty calorie guys are all small. Um, well, to put to put his value in perspective, you have to look at a couple of trades he was in. In 2001, he's basically traded for the rights to Paul Gasol when Paul was it, a rookie. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it's with Jamal Tinsley. And well, kind of liked. So Atlanta's like, we could take Pau Gasol, this young kid from Spain, or we could lock in a Sharif Abdul Rahim. And Prime they actually Sharif. thought that was a smarter, smarter idea. Then in 04, he got traded with Theo Ratliff for That was the Rashid deal, wasn't it? Wesley Person and Rashid Wallace. Rashid, that's the best jersey ever. The Rashid Wallace the Atlanta Wendell. Hawks jersey. Because he played one game. Yeah, that'll be like the Tom Brady Bucks jersey. So <laughs> you think he's only gonna play one game? Thirteenth <laughs> pick. So much disdain. I'm so mad. I get madder every day. 
<laughs> I was watching Falcons, Falcons Patriots Super Bowl today. I was like, how can he play for another team? This is insane. Cinema this is the greatest win Don't anyone's ever had. I'm taking Kerry Kittles with the 13th pick for this will be for oh Charlotte. Kerry Kittles. Good fit know, for Charlotte. Good value. Short, shorter career than it should have been. He had some health issues. But I gotta say, the Celtics went against him in two straight playoff series. I was always scared when he was open. He was one of those guys that when he missed, you were surprised. And the stats don't actually back it up. I, his stats are okay, but it just He's one of those guys, there was something about how he carried himself and shot the basketball that you just felt like, oh, that's going in. 30, 38% career three-point shooter. He took 3.6 a game. 14-point uh, career scorer. Just got traded to the Clippers in 2005 and his career like basically abruptly ended. But uh, I always thought him and Kid were good together. I enjoyed that backcourt. Okay, the so, last pick. Dante Jones, remember Mississippi State? I love that Final Four. Oh, yeah. Um, Malik well, Rose still available. Randy Livingston, go Tigers. Yeah, let's talk about some of the guys that are available because we also have Derek Fisher's available, Eric Dampier. Travis Knight is available. Little Shannon Anderson. Muchi Norris, who brought Shannon back Anderson, the Afro. 10 years in, out of Georgia. Yeah. Um, Lorenzen Wright, you mentioned him. Jeff McGinnis. Jeff Famous McGinnis. chemistry killer. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you made the joke quicker than I did. As I was about to say it out loud, Priest Lauderdale, just a couple years out of Central State University, but I'm sure a lot of dudes <laughs> kind of liked him when they saw him walk into a room. They're like, All so right, who are you so taking? Othella Harrington, twelve years in it. You know who I always sneaky liked was Ryan Miner out of Oklahoma. Did not play. Oh, well. yeah, didn't Remember make that. Uh, you got to go, Derek Fisher here. You know what I'm getting? I don't want him to coach. I don't want him to be my executive. But I wanted to be a guy that I trust, and for some reason, extended his career another four or five years by dribbling into everybody on open layups because he could never get a fucking shot off against anybody towards the end, and the ref gave him the call every damn time down the court. So if I know I'm getting that, if I know I'm getting, as soon as Fisher slows down, the refs are going to bail him out for another four or five years. Give me that guy. He played 18 seasons. He's fifth in this class in minutes, 32,719 minutes. The uh, advanced metrics do not like him, but came up big in a lot of big games. So thanks for watching the 1996 redraft. You can check out all the redrafts on the Book of Basketball podcast, and you can check them out on YouTube as well because we'll be putting them up on there. So stay tuned for more hilarity, more strange picks, more fun stuff until then.